Hey everyone, it's Brian. In this video, I'd like to tackle this problem, which is an eigenvalue problem, or you might call it an eigenfunction problem, or even a boundary value problem. And it has to do with this differential equation, y double prime plus, plus lambda y equals zero, with the initial conditions that y of zero is zero, and y prime of pi is zero. And there's a couple different things that can happen with this. So depending on what lambda is, lambda being your eigenvalue, different things will happen to this function. For example, one thing that could happen is that lambda is zero. This might be the most boring case, but if lambda is zero, that means our differential equation re would reduce to y double prime is equal to zero. Well, if y double prime is equal to zero, that means that y prime would be some constant. A, right? If I take the derivative of a constant, I get zero. And if y prime is a constant, that means that y would be, well, if I integrate this again, this would be something like at plus b. And at this point, I can figure out the entire solution because I know what the initial conditions are. Well, if I look at this first initial condition, y prime of pi is equal to zero meaning that if I plug pi into the y prime equation, well, there's nowhere really to plug in for pi, so this is just equals zero. So in other words, a is equal to zero. Hmm, it's kind of boring. Well, um, that means this whole term is gonna drop out, right? And I can use the same logic with this first condition that y of zero is equal to zero. Well, that means I plug in zero for y, I need to plug in zero for t. Well, there's nothing really to plug in anymore. I'm just getting that b is equal to zero. Well, if a and b are zero in this equation, that means I just have y is equal to zero. And in other words, I've got a trivial solution, and that's pretty boring. If lambda is zero, we get a trivial solution. What about if lambda is negative? Well, if lambda is negative, all of a sudden, this becomes something I can solve using the techniques you've probably learned earlier in your differential equations class. So I would reduce this to the auxiliary or characteristic equation, r squared plus lambda is equal to zero. And this means that r squared is equal to minus lambda, or that r is equal to plus or minus square root of minus lambda. Now, this might look a little weird, but remember, lambda is negative. So this is really a positive inside the square root. In other words, I'm getting two real roots, one being plus root lambda and one being minus root lambda. Minus root minus lambda, that is. So if you have two roots of the auxiliary or characteristic equation, what's your solution? Well, it has the form y equals c1 e to the first root. So that's root minus lambda t plus c2 e to the other root. That's minus root minus lambda t. And I can use these initial conditions again. So the first one says that if y of zero, uh, if I, y of zero is zero. So in other words, if I plug in zero for t, I should get zero for y. Well, that's gonna mean that zero is equal to c1, e to the zero is one, plus c2, e to the zero is one. Okay, I've got one equation, and I'm gonna to need to take the derivative in order to get this second equation. So let's just take the derivative here real quick. And so that comes from just using differentiation rules on the exponential function. Now, if you'll notice from this initial condition, if I plug in pi for t, I should get zero for y. Before I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna go over here Notice that c1 plus c2 is zero. That means c2 is equal to minus c1. So I could just replace this c2 with minus c1. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna factor out that c1, and I'm gonna factor out that square root of minus lambda. And that's just gonna give me e to the root minus lambda t minus, minus a minus, so it can be a plus, e to the minus square root minus lambda t.
And this initial condition says that if I plug in pi for t, that's going to give me 0. We'll take a look at this. Minus lambda square rooted is not 0. right? We assumed that because lambda was negative. I've got e to something plus e to something else. Now the exponential function is never negative. So this piece is not equal to 0. This piece is not equal to 0. But I have things multiplied equal to 0. That means that c1 has to be 0. And if c1 is equal to 0, that means c2 is equal to 0. And if you go to our y equals equation, that means I've got y equals 0 and plus 0. So in other words, I have the trivial solution once again. Now things finally start to get interesting when lambda is positive, because although the roots of the characteristic or auxiliary equation are the same, since lambda is positive, this is actually a negative under the square root, which means these values are really plus or minus square root of lambda i. And when you have imaginary roots to your characteristic or auxiliary equation, the solution looks like this. y equals c1 e to the real root, in other words, e to the 0, cosine of the imaginary part t, plus c2 e to the 0, sine the imaginary part times t. Now let's use our initial conditions again. y of 0 is 0. So it means I'm going to get 0 for y. This would be c1. Cosine of 0 is 1. Plus c2. Sine of 0 is 0. So it looks like I'm getting c1 is equal to 0. So our solution reduces to just c2 sine square root lambda t. To use this other initial condition, I'm going to have to take the derivative. So that's just taking the derivative of sine. And if I plug in pi, I'm supposed to get 0. Now let's observe something again. Square root lambda is not equal to 0 by assumption. Lambda is positive. I'm also going to assume now that c2 is not equal to 0. Now why is that? If c2 was 0, well, I'd have y equals 0. I'd have the trivial solution again. And that means no matter what lambda was, I'd have the trivial solution. Now, I want to get something from this. So I'm going to say c2 is not 0. Well, if I have things multiplied being 0, that must mean that this cosine factor has to be 0. Now, when is cosine 0? Cosine is 0 when the inside is equal to an odd multiple of pi over 2, right? Pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2. And the way we represent that is pi over 2 times some odd number. And an odd number looks like, I'll say, 2n minus 1. And you can check that for n in the integers is how we say that. So this would be like pi over 2 times 1, pi over 2 times 3, pi over 2 times 5. And now we simply solve for lambda. So I can cancel these pi's, right? And then I can square both sides and get that lambda is 2n minus 1 over 2 all squared. And this, you might see in textbooks, lambda sub n. These are all of your eigenvalues. So I have sort of an infinite number of them, sort of, in a way. Um, but this is what represents your eigenvalues for this function. Now, what is the actual eigenfunction? It's simply plugging in this lambda into this equation. And you'll notice that I never actually solved for c2. I'm just going to call that c sub n, or you might just see it written as c. And then this would be sine of square root of 2n minus 1 squared over 4t 
or that cn sine of 2n minus 1 over 2t. And this would be the eigenfunction associated to this eigenvalue for this differential equation with these initial conditions. Hey, I hope you got something out of this video if this was a little bit involved. So if you want to take a look, remember there's three different cases you really have to check with this, but the only one that happened to matter was when lambda was positive. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos just like this one, make sure to subscribe. Have a fantastic day.